We are back again this week in Genesis chapter 15, and we'll be reading uh, beginning with verse 6 and, uh, and going through verse 21. It's not that uh, I couldn't bring myself, if you were here last week, you know that the first six verses are the first part of this passage. Um, I couldn't bring myself to drop verse six from the second part of the passage just because it's such an important verse. And let me go ahead and invite you, since this is a longer passage, go ahead and be seated so that you can uh, focus on hearing the word read. Begin with verse six. And he, the Lord, brought Abram outside and said, I'm sorry, I'm starting in verse 5. Let's go to verse 6. And he, the Lord, uh, and he, Abram, believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? And God said to Abram, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace." You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. It's the word of God. May he add his blessing blessing to it to our hearts. Let's pray. Father, as we look again at this absolutely rich passage that we can Uh, unfortunately only scratch a little deeply into, we pray that your spirit would help us to glean from it all that you intend. We pray this uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning we're picking up from last Sunday, uh, and as I pointed out last week, this narrative, which consists of all of Genesis 15, breaks down into two parallel parts. The first part is uh, verses 1 through 6, which is God, God's promise of posterity uh, by oath. And then the second part begins in verse 7 and goes to the end of the chapter, and it's God's promise of a homeland by a covenant. So, so we see two expressions of God's promise to Abram, one regarding posterity and the other regarding land or a grant of land. Now, last week we covered the, the promise of posper, pro, posterity in verses 1 through 6, so this week we're going to look at the promise of a homeland by covenant. Now, recall from last week, I pointed out that each of these two parallel sections can be divided up and kind of uh, subtitled uh, God's promise, God's apprehen- or Ab- God's promise, Abram's apprehension, and God's reassurance. And God's promise in this section comes in verse 7. Abram's apprehension is expressed in verse 8. And God's reassurance is all of verses 9 all the way to the end of the chapter. So look at God's promise. We see that in God's promise, he promised promised Abram a land. He, he promised him this land, the land that Abram was dwelling in, which is at the time was, was the very heart of the, of the land of Canaan. And as we'll read in verses 18 to 21, or as we read in verses 18 to 21, it was, it was an extensive amount of 
of land that God was promising to Abram. Then in verse 8, we see Abram's apprehension. Uh, he, he says, how am I to know that I shall possess it? Well, what was true last week in the first part of the narrative is also true here. Abram was a uh, question that he questions God, but it's not a question from unbelief. It's a question from anxiety, a question where he's just sharing his heart with God. He trusts God. He just is anxious about how this is going to come about. Uh, he, he's, he's stepped out in faith, but he's struggling with an ancient, anxious, anxious moment, which I think is really important for us to be aware of. Because it, it, we have the tendency to, to blow Abram into this, this, uh, this superhero kind of Christian or Christian, superhero kind of believer uh, and, and, and not be able to relate with him anymore. But here he is anxious. He has the promise of God. He trusts in God, but he's expressing his anxieties. And that makes him much more like me and probably much more like you. We can understand. We can relate a lot more. So he expresses his apprehension. So God reassures him, beginning in verse 9 and going to the end of the chapter. Now, I want us to notice something about this, that in the midst of this reassuring passage, uh, there's, a, there's a prophecy in verses 12 to 16. And that prophecy, at least part of it, is not that reassuring. So in the midst of God's reassurance, we have some not so much reassurance. Uh, and, and it helps us, I think it'll help us to, to see this, to know that sometimes in God's promises to us, in his reassurance of us, there, there's, a, there's a period of time where we have to be patient and wait because he's doing stuff in that time as well. So let's look at that together. Um, look at verses 12 to 14, and we're going to break them down one at a time. It says, as the, verse 12, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. This deep sleep that he fell into is, is a deep sleep that was brought on by the presence of God. It, it's, it, it's a deep kind of uh, 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 spiritual sleep that, that's put on by the holiness of God coming and giving words of prophecy to Abram. And, and the great, dreadful and great darkness that's spoken of there fell on, on Abram because of the gravity because of the weightiness of the prophecy that he was receiving. So verse 13 goes on to say, Then the Lord said to Abram, and here it comes, the prophecy, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Now, Abram wouldn't experience that. He wouldn't live to see it. Verse 15 tells us that he would be blessed in this, in this life, he would die at a good old age and in peace, and that's good news. That, that's an encouragement to him. But Abram's offspring, it says, would suffer 400 years. That's actually kind of rounded off. The 400 years of slavery and affliction in Egypt. We know it's in Egypt. The people listening to Moses tell the story would know this is talking about the time that, that our people spent in Egypt. And the darkness that fell on Abram was just because of just how intense that suffering and that affliction of his offspring was going to be. And the people that were hearing this as Moses spoke it would hear that and they would feel that darkness. They would feel that dread even though they had been taken out of that captivity in Egypt. They would still feel it. You know, when something awful has happened to you and you're out of it, Still, when you think back to it, you can feel the, the, just the weightiness of it. You can sometimes feel overwhelmed by the thought of it again. And that's what they would have felt. And that would have, in a sense, been a good thing because they were constantly, as they looked in the wilderness and they were facing uh, tr difficulties there, they were beginning to forget how bad it was in Egypt. And they wanted to go back. And this would remind them, no, you don't want to go back. And now comes reassurance, finally. Verse 14, But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now that part of the prophecy, that great possessions part, is, is fulfilled actually in Exodus 12, verses 35 and 36, where it says that the people of Israel had, had uh, asked the Egyptians for silver and gold jewelry and clothing, and the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they 
gave them what they asked, gold, silver, clothing. And it says in verse 36 of Exodus 12, thus they plundered the Egyptians. So that was the fulfillment of that prophecy. Then the prophecy continues in verses 15 and 16. God speaks to, first to Abram specifically. He says, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age. You shall be buried, it says, literally, with a gray, in, a, in your gray-headedness. Um, in a good old age. So Abram would receive that. That go to your fathers in peace and buried in a good old age. He, he would see that as, as a very uh, profound blessing. It would be very encouraging to him in his anxiety. But then the next part also is reassurance. It says, and they, meaning your offspring, who have endured this 400, for 400 years this affliction, they shall come back here in the fourth generation. And then it says something we need to look into. It says, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. What does that mean? I think it warrants a closer look since the judgment that it foreshadows is a source of bewilderment for many people, even many believers. Uh, first of all, let me just say that when he says the, 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 uh, the sin or the, the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete, he doesn't mean just the Amorites. That's a, a figure of speech. It's called a synecdoche. It's the part for the whole. It, he means every nation that's in this Canaanite area. And he lists 10 of them at the end of, at the, end of the chapter. So, so when it says Amorites, it doesn't just mean the Amorites. It means all of them together. And the fact that he lists 10 at the end of the chapter, remember 10 is the number in this time, in this ancient Hebrew uh, uh, writing, 10 is the number of completion. So, so what he's saying that is, is they will be complete, they, they will be completely uh, ready for judgment. They will be so iniquitous, so full of sin, that, they will, that it'll be time for judgment for them. And that's what's coming. And we know when you look at the book of Joshua that that time eventually comes. And Joshua, in a conversation that I had not too long ago with some, some mature believers in Christ, said that Joshua is one of those books, and I don't know if you've read it recently, but it's got some amazing stories in it that we love to tell kids. But if you tell the stories of Joshua to kids, my guess is you leave a lot of the details out. Because there's stuff in there that is tough to swallow. Like God saying, when you go to this city, kill everything. Man, woman, child, infant, animal, everything that lives, kill it all. Annihilate the whole place. So what in the world do we do with that kind of information? And for us, we can, for people like me, we can go, well, God said it. He knows what he's doing. I can move on. But for a lot of people who think more deeply than me, who probably maybe have a closer relationship to God, they look at that and they go, wait a minute. That's hard to swallow. That's a difficult thing. It, it, it causes anywhere from discomfort to dismay in their lives as they think about those things. And I had this conversation going, and, and some of the people there were expressing the fact that the, even though they believe it, they don't doubt it, it, they struggle with what it says. Why would God do that? What's going on there? How can I wrap my brain around it? Some, not this group, but some have called God's command to Joshua genocide. Have you ever heard that? So something I've heard more uh, often recently. Uh, but this wasn't genocide. This wasn't the same thing as ethnic cleansing that we've seen in history and that we see sometimes still today in some places. Since it was a, an across-the-board uh, uh, judgment, not, not ethnically related, uh, God's command was not ethnically related, it was across-the-board judgment against iniquity. Still, admittedly, that's not an easy answer to our discomfort. It might help a little, uh, but this might help, or, or hopefully it will, maybe it won't. But when the Bible says the Amorites' evil had reached its full measure, from our place now and our culture now, looking back, we can't imagine the atrocities that were going on in that area at the time of Joshua, when that judgment came. And it wasn't everyone, but there were specific places where Jesus said, do this, or where God said, do this. Now, we know that infant and child sacrifice in that area had become common. 
was common. And that enough ought to just make you go, oh, my. But that's a small sample of the violent atrocities and sexual sin that was going on in this place. Human evil can reach an unimaginably dark levels rather easily. And the heart can be so hardened that no repentance is possible. And by the time of Joshua, the level of evil among these people had reached a low point that's virtually inconceivable to our culturally protected minds. Their hearts would have no quarter with their neighbors. I read a news story this week speaking of the evil that can so easily come in certain cultures and places. I read a news story this week about a 12-year-old girl in Honduras who was raped by a family member of her mom's boyfriend. And she was pregnant. And she's expecting any day now. 12 years old, still a child. When she, was, when she first discovered that she was pregnant, she asked the caseworker if she could have a doll instead. The perpetrator is in jail, but not for much longer. And meanwhile, his family is threatening the little girl and her mother with violence. They fear for their lives. They're trying to want to run away from their home and their city, but that means exposure to more, potentially more violence from others or sickness or starvation. But the way things are, the risk might be worth it. Their fear of the perpetrator and his family is not an overreaction. An evil subculture is pervasive there. Women and girls are vulnerable to men who view women as, as dispensable objects to be used. And apparently the larger culture doesn't have enough clout to put an end to it. I tell you that to point out that human evil can reach unimaginably dark levels rather easily. And the Bible isn't the only ancient document that records the evil of the people in the land of Canaan at the time of Joshua. Did you know that? Maybe you've heard the name William F. Albright. He's a renowned archaeologist. And in 1929, along the coast of Syria, he and his team found what we call Ugaritic texts, uh, text, ancient texts around, written around 1400 B.C. And they spoke of the wickedness of the people, the ancient people, in the area of Canaan at the time of Joshua. They didn't mention Joshua, but it was the same contemporary to that time. It, it, it kind of catalogs some of the evils that they saw there. The gods they worshipped were reflective of the Canaanite practices. They degraded themselves with violence, with unrestrained sexual indulgences. And God, so God's judgment was justified just as it had been in judging the evil of the, of the land before the, before the flood, by the flood. Now we shudder when we hear the story of that 12-year-old girl Yet it's quite possible and even probable that the level of evil that, was, that that expresses pales in comparison to the level of evil that was in Canaan, the land of Canaan at the time of Joshua. At least, at least we ought to consider the possibility that from our distance, our judgment is uninformed and underqualified to pass a verdict. I realize that doesn't necessarily remove all the discomfort from the command of total annihilation of of city, of people, to Joshua, but maybe it helps mitigate the sense of bewilderment and approach a place of peace. Convinced, convinced that an all-seeing, all-knowing, and good God is more just than we can ever be. Now, I'm, I suspect there are some in this room that needed to hear all that. For the rest of you who are like me going, all right, God said it, I'm okay with it. It's not quite that easy, I know, but, but I hope, hopefully this will help, help some of you with that struggle. Now, before we leave this part of the story, one more thing warrants notice here. This still stands as both a warning 
and an offering of grace. The only thing standing between us and God's judgment and wrath is Jesus Christ. The only thing, he keeps all who trust in him safe. Not because he's blocking God's wrath from us, but because he has satisfied God's wrath for us. He has fully satisfied, fully paid our debts. Judgment is not just an Old Testament thing. It's a New Testament anticipation. And we need to remember that. Sin will be judged and condemned. That's justice, and God is just. All have sinned, the Scripture says, and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus, His Son, has paid the penalty for those who are in Christ by faith. Paid the penalty. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord, it says in Romans 6. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Romans 8.1, because Jesus paid our debt. You see, God's love, God's love is an extraordinary love, a blessings of Abraham kind of love. Who doesn't need love? God sent his son to bear the cost of sin. That's love beyond understanding. The love, that love is the atmosphere of blessing God has for everyone who trusts in him. This deliverance is ours by faith in Jesus Christ alone. We can't gain it any other way. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says, This is the testimony. God has given us eternal life. This life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. Well, all of that, and in the face of that judgment, but that grace that confronts it, that brings us to this extraordinary covenant ratification ceremony. And this is why this passage is one of my favorite Old Testament passages. You remember how it's set up in verses 9 through 11? I just kind of re review it. A Abram is told to get a heifer, uh, a, 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 well, let me read, a, a ram and, and, a, and a, a lamb, I think. What was it? Verses 9 through 11, um, he, uh, God says, bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat, that's what I forgot, three years old, and a ram three years old, a turtle dove and a young pigeon. So Abram brings them, he knows what to do with them, he knows what's going on, he cuts them in half and lays them on either side of a path, just a, a, a bloody mess, carnage, messy, smelly, all the above. And Abram knows what this is. This is a covenant about to be made. So he does. He, 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 he cuts the bigger animals in two and sets them on either side of a, of, a, of a path. And the birds he kills and puts them on either side as well. The Bible tells us that, in, uh, that, that this is a covenant. And in other ancient documents, we, we come to understand not only that the Bible, what the Bible tells us, we see that, that this is a, was a common thing for these people. Abram knew what he was doing because the other cultures around him and his own did this kind of thing. They made covenants. Now, you and I, when we buy a car and we don't have enough money to pay for it, or we buy a house and we don't have enough to pay for it, we don't make a covenant, right? We, we make a contract. And when we make a contract, what do we do? We sign our name at the bottom of some paper, and that paper is legally, uh, uh, legally enforced. It's, if, you, if, you don't, if you aren't good to your contract, if you don't pay the money back, there's financial penalties for that. <laughs> we are such wimps compared to these ancients. They didn't sign contracts. They cut covenants. Look at the covenant ceremony preparation, cutting of these animals, blood and guts everywhere. Every, he cut the animals, laid them on either side of a path. In ancient prom, and, and what is that going on? What's going on there? In ancient practices, the way they made a covenant was they took animals, they would cut them in two, 
lay them on either side of a path, and those who are covenanting with each other, say two neighbors over property and, and the fact that they're butting up to one another, they're agreeing to not to infringe on the other, they would do this ceremony and together they would walk between the pieces of those animals. And it was as if they were saying, may I become like these animals if I don't keep my word to you. That's a lot more than a signature on the line of a piece of paper, isn't it? And we know that's what the meaning is because we see it expressed in, in various ways in, in other documents, but also in the Bible, Jeremiah 34, verse 18, makes it very clear that this is what's going on. Not, not this particular covenant, but another one that it speaks of. God says, the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, listen to this, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and pass between its parts. That's the level of a covenant. It goes on to say, their dead bodies shall be food for the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. Doesn't that kind of make a contract seem like a wimpy thing? And aren't you glad we don't do those kind of covenants anymore? <laughs> no, but none, of, none of us would be driving new cars or owning homes. Most of us wouldn't be. In these ancient cultures, neighbors would do that. Kings would do that with vassals. Sometimes the king would pass through with the vassal. More often he would say, I'm the one in charge here. You pass through the pieces. And they were saying when they did that, may what happened to this animal happen to me if I break the covenant. And that's where the gospel is demonstrated in what happened in Genesis 15. And this is what I love so much. The gospel comes of God's grace comes to bright glory in what happens here. Who passed through the pieces? Abram? God and Abram? No. The smoking pot and the flaming torch signified God. Abram's over there sleeping. God passed through the pieces. Bruce Waltke says, God is invoking a curse upon himself if he does not keep the covenant. I said last week that this mesmerizing ceremony is probably the clearest demonstration of the gospel of God's grace in the whole Old Testament. I think that's, I stand by what I said. And this is why God took upon himself the curse of covenant breaking. It's as if God knew Abram's thoughts. See, Abram, like you and I, would go, well, God's not going to break his word. He's not going to break a covenant. But, but you know what? I know me. And I'm not sure, so sure that I can keep from breaking the covenant. In fact, God who knows me knows I can't keep from breaking the covenant. And so God told Abram, what he told me, what he tells you is I will pass through the pieces. I will invoke the curse of covenant breaking on myself. You don't have to be involved. God knew Abram would fail. God knows that I will fail, that I will be a covenant breaker. So he took on himself the curse of the covenant for Abram, for you, and for me. So where is that covenant curse played out? If God took it upon himself, how did he bear the penalty of Abram's breaking of it and our breaking of it? How did he do it? And I know you know the answer to that. Centuries later, God was nailed to a cross. His body broken, his blood spilled, and he died. Jesus, God the Son, endured the curse in our place. God, the scripture says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And that's what God was doing when he passed through the pieces alone. Isn't that astonishing? Isn't that glorious? He was owning the penalty for covenant breaking, not his, but ours. That's the clearest demonstration of the gospel of God's grace in the Old Testament. Our faithfulness, brothers and sisters, our faithfulness is hardly a firm rock on which to anchor any assurance of God's acceptance.
Our faithfulness? You want to anchor it there? I don't. Our faithfulness is not a firm rock, but God's faithfulness is. God's faithfulness is the anchor of our souls. The great basis of Christian assurance is not fixed on how consistently our hearts are set on God, but on how securely our Heavenly Father's heart is set on us. Let me read that again. The great basis of Christian assurance is not fixed on how consistently our hearts are set on God, but on how securely our Heavenly Father's heart is set on us. So that means when we understand that, when we grasp that, when we think of ourselves, we need to not anchor what we think about ourselves in what we think about ourselves, but what God thinks about us. And God loves us. He loves us even as he loves his son, Jesus Christ. John 17, 23 says. That's a profound love. When you think of yourself, do you think of yourself as... With, with that in view, J.I. Packer, who I've mentioned many times, wrote something that I return to countless times in my Christian faith, and I keep returning to it. I keep it on my wall in my, in my office. If you ever come and say, where is it? I'll show it to you. It's something that is true about this. It's, it's so relevant to this, and it's so encouraging that it's worth reading over and over again. I've said it to you before. I'm going to say it to you again. Here's what he wrote. And this is in reference to God walking between the pieces and bearing the curse that we deserve. Packer wrote, There is unspeakable comfort in knowing that God is constantly taking knowledge of me in love and watching over me for my good. There is tremendous relief in knowing that his love to me is utterly realistic based at every point on prior knowledge of the worst about me, so that no discovery can now disillusion him about myself. No discovery can quench his determination to bless me. There is certainly great cause for humility at the thought that he sees all the twisted things about me that my fellow humans do not see, and that he sees more corruption in me that, than, than, which, than that which I myself see. There is, however, equally great incentive to worship and love God in the thought that for some unfathomable reason, he wants me as his friend and desires me to be his friend and has given his son to die for me in order to realize this purpose. God passed through the pieces alone. We have all along with Abram, broken the covenant. But God bore the curse in our place. His oath, His covenant, His blood. What kind of love is this? Let's pray together. Father, this is astonishing. This is overwhelming. How can, you, how can you love so much those who rebel so easily? How can you love so much those who are your enemies? How can you endure? Lord Jesus, so great a suffering so that we might be set free from condemnation and wrath. Not just set free, but brought into a family and brought into a kingdom and see the smile of a father as he looks at us fully, completely, forgiven, and reconciled. How can you love us that much? Thank you that you do.
In Jesus' name, amen.